You're still watching the news day here on the Arise News Channel. Even as countries tackle the COVID-19 pandemic, global leaders under the auspices of the World Health Organization are uniting to ensure access to new vaccines, tests, and treatments for coronavirus. One of the special envoys working on this groundbreaking collaboration is Nigeria's former finance minister and former managing director of the World Bank, Dr. Ngozi Okonjo-Iweala. Dr. Okonjo-Iweala is the board chair of Gavi, a vaccine alliance. Gavi is one of the leading players in global health, providing services and underpinning human and economic development. Dr. Ngozi Iweala joins us live now from Washington, D.C. Many thanks for joining us. Yes. Now, welcome, Doctor. And let's start it off by asking, as the chairperson of the Gavi Alliance, could you bring us up to speed on what your organization is doing in terms of vaccine and the risk for a vaccine for COVID-19? Well, thank you, uh, Aaron and Adesua. Um, good, good morning from here. Good afternoon over there. Um, Gavi, the Vaccine Alliance, whose board I chair, is uh, one of the central organizations involved in the issue of trying to find, develop, and distribute a COVID vaccine or vaccines. Um, at the moment, the w uh, WHO, in conjunction with world leaders, launched a, pro a, a, a project, uh, an international project called the ACT Accelerator, with the idea of accelerating the development and uh, uh, manufacture and distribution of these vaccines. Gavi and CEPI, the Coalition for Epidemic Pre Preparedness Innovation, are the two organizations leading in this. As soon as these vaccines or vaccine are identified and they are certified to be of high quality, safe for humans, uh, and then they are manufactured in the right number of doses, Gavi, uh, will discuss and negotiate with the manufacturers sufficient doses which it will then distribute in a manner that will be affordable and equitable uh, to developing countries, in fact, all over the world. And that's the role Gavi will play, to make sure that this vaccine gets to all that need it. Indeed. And Madam, can I just ask you, do you think that there's too much emphasis on vaccine? And I ask because uh, we've had the likes of the common cold, malaria, that have not had vaccines for years. What if one is not found for COVID-19? What do you say to those who say we are spending too much on something we know too little about? Well, you know, there's a, there's a good point that there have been infectious diseases in the past for which no vaccine uh, has yet been found. I mean, HIV AIDS is one where, where they're still searching for a vaccine. But the reason people are focusing on vaccines is because the, this is the most sustainable solution uh, to the problem of COVID. If you can prevent it, uh, then all the better. There's a flu vaccine, as you know, which many people over here take each year. Of course, you can have other remedies like therapeutics, medicines you take when you get the, the, um, the virus. But why would you want to wait until you get it? Vaccines are the best prevention and the most cost-effective way of dealing with this. You won't spend as much money once you have everybody vaccinated. All right, now, Doctor, beyond the debt relief African countries recently secured from foreign creditors, and especially China, there is still a clamor by some countries for debt forgiveness. Do you think this is something creditors are ready to uh, countenance given the effects of the pandemic on global economy? Well, thank you. One of the, uh, as you know, I'm also an AU envoy for COVID-19, along with four other high-level Africans to try and find resources for the continent. And one of the key things we are arguing for is for a two-year standstill uh, we are saying that we need this standstill across the board for bilateral and commercial debt in order to give countries um, relief, put resources in their hands that they would have used to service debt. They can use it to fight the impact of this pandemic. And the G20 has opened the door by saying that they'll grant a standstill to the end of this year. We think that's not enough and we're pushing. During the two-year standstill, we can now have a chance to look at each country, because each country is slightly different in terms of the burden of debt and the debt service 
that it has to do compared to the re revenues it has. If this will give us a chance to look, the some countries may need their debt reprofiled. That is, it's not about debt forgiveness. It's just about rescheduling. There may be other poorer countries that need the debt forgiveness, like the IMF has already given 19 low-income countries in Africa debt forgiveness or debt relief, and to the tune of $198 million. Maybe some countries will need that. We will look at it. But you cannot do all this unless you have a standstill that gives you time to examine these issues. So that's what we think is most important now. And, Madam, given your experience working with the World Bank, uh, what kind of developmental assistance do you think that uh, so the bank can provide to African countries uh, handling this pandemic at a time like this? Well, let me say something. First of all, uh, I want to say how much African countries themselves are helping themselves. It's uh, quite impressive the number of measures they've taken in many countries. Taxes have been suspended or, or you know, cancelled uh, for, for, for businesses and for, um, for households. Um, people have, you know, cancelled tariffs. There have been so many measures put in place by African countries. African countries have also contributed $60 million, along with African philanthropists, to a fund that the AU has opened. So before we talk about other people helping, you have to ask, what have we done for ourselves? And we have done quite a lot. We've implemented fiscal stimulus of 0.8% of GDP on the continent. This is not enough. So that is why it is then necessary that the AU has asked that we look for resources outside. And the World Bank, you mentioned the World Bank, but the other organizations, the World Bank has um, given some emergency relief to African countries and other developing countries to enable them cope with the health crisis. This is almost $300 million, but they also have committed $14 billion uh, to help countries fight the economic and health impact of the pandemic. The IMF has uh, committed $11 billion as at this moment. Islamic Development Bank, about $1.3 billion. And so, you know, you have various organizations, and you know that the African Development Bank has a $10 billion COVID-19 fund for the continent. All right. Um, it's quite worrying from some analysts that China is Africa's biggest creditor. Should the country be worried? And what can the government do to preempt the economic implication of China's troubled economy in the post-pandemic era? Well, um, I, I think that uh, China has, is part of the G20. And um, it has agreed, along with the other G20 members, uh, to go into this standstill. Of course, we are still pushing China to be a leader in terms of granting African countries these two years so that we can then look with them at the bilateral debt of each country and know how to treat it. So I think China is coming along. I mean, my general advice on debt to every country, and you know that I've had a lot of experience in this, is to go cautiously and never to take on more debt than you can service uh, by growing your economy. You always need to look not only at debt to GDP ratios, but also debt service to revenue. Can you afford to service the debt? So with respect to China and other creditors, yes, if it can help you build infrastructure, grow your economy, it's good. It's OK to take some amount of debt, but please do it very cautiously. Now, coming to the issue of the how to deal with the impact uh, of China, um, China's economy and, and the link to Africa post-COVID, this is a very important question because China has become one of the biggest uh, markets for our exports. So, of course, when the Chinese economy is down, that means that the demand for our exports is also lower. And this is going to be an issue because the Chinese economy is expected by the IMF projections to grow maybe at 1% this year. For the, in fact, China has not seen this kind of growth for decades. It's been growing at double digits, then 6%. So when it grows at 1%, that means that for us, this is going to be problematic. Europe is going to contract. So we need to ask ourselves, what do we do now in order to 
diversify our economies for the long term so that we don't we are not so dependent on exports you have highlighted what african countries are doing to respond to this pandemic in financial times uh, but beyond the debt which a lot of african countries are struggling with uh, what worries you the most about african economies i think um what worries me the most but also gives me uh, much hope is uh, the issue of employment. You know, we have a very young population. In most of our countries, 60% of the population is 35 years and, and below. That means jobs and jobs is the key. What do we do with our youth? So for our economies, we've got to look at every opportunity for creating jobs. And post pandemic, we have the chance to really relook at the way that our development is going. We have a chance to look at some supply chains that we can bring back on the continent and improve our manufacturing base. We have the African Continental Free Trade Agreement. Maybe some of our countries can specialize in manufacturing certain things which they can trade with neighbors. You know we import 94% of the pharmaceutical products we use on the continent. Why can't we? specialized some countries to manufacture uh, some of those. Nigeria is one with a large population. South Africa is another. There are others with that capability. So my, my worry is how do we create good jobs for our, for our young people? And uh, how do we support our young entrepreneurs so that they can create jobs for themselves and for others? That's my biggest worry. But it's also the biggest opportunity I see and I think that I have hope we can do it. All right. Um, the AFTA is in line with the African 2063 vision. How can Nigeria and African countries truly optimize this intra-African trade? I think we can launch the, 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 the Continental Free Trade Agreement. I believe it was supposed to be launched in July, but because of the COVID pandemic, uh, maybe that will be postponed. I think we should do it as soon as possible. Um, we should look to specialization. You know, if we all produce the same things, then trading with each other will not be as effective. We really need to step back and look at what are the things that countries can specialize in. Maybe there are those who can do well in manufacturing textiles, in processing agricultural products of one type or the other, and trading with the neighbors. And uh, so I think this is the way we need to look at it. How do we increase that trade? Now, the other thing I want to mention is, of course, logistics. And I think that the, uh, the African countries have been working well on this. How do we improve border closures and remove all the checkpoints so that goods can move easily from one country to the other? So these are some of the things we need to look at remaining obstacles. We need to implement the trade, but above all, we need to specialize some countries in producing one product or the other that we can trade with each other. This is, of course, a longer term dream and plan. We also need to go digital. Um, you know, the technology is enabling a lot of trade, and uh, this is uh, something else we need to look at. How can it facilitate increased trade within the continent? Thank you very much, ma'am, for those points. Uh, you, you said unemployment on the continent is one that gives you great concern. Uh, but I would like to ask you, how can African countries provide jobs without stable, efficient, low-carbon, climate-friendly energy source? How can they do that? Why is power uh, such a problematic issue on the continent? You're absolutely right, Adesua. Power is a big issue. 55% of our households on the continent still do not have access uh, to power, and our businesses as well. And without this, we cannot really move forward. That's why I mentioned that infrastructure, improving that will be key. Um, I think that each country is in a different position, but many are struggling with how do you have um, an effective, uh, effective transmission and distribution of power. In many countries now, generation is not so much an issue because countries are having auctions and other things to bring in 
independent power producers. But transmission distribution at an affordable price to the population, but also a price that will clear the market and enable our power companies to operate in a profitable manner. That's what we are struggling. My own strong belief is that we haven't worked out the financial basis for our power sector in ma many countries. And that is what is holding us back. So we really need to sit back and work out the fin finances for each sector. What investments do we need? Many countries have not invested in, in maintaining their power sector for years. What investments? How do we pay transmission? How do we pay distribution companies? How, how do we make the whole power sector work financially? That is the key that is holding us back. Now, you mentioned something really important, green, climate friendly. You know that two thirds of the power we need on the continent has not yet been, been uh, built or developed. So we have a huge chance in Africa that any new power development can be with renewables, things that are low carbon, types of power sources. And I think that that's a winner. We can actually lead the world in this, and we have the opportunity because we are very good with renewables. All right, um, you're also on the board of Twitter. And how can this pandemic affected global business outlook, and what can Nigeria do to avoid a W-shaped recovery? Well, right now, I can tell you that uh, all projections for global uh, economic outlook don't look very good. Um, the, the preliminary projections we have for the continent are for a contraction of about 2 percent. And I think for Nigeria, it's in the neighborhood of 3 percent. But the IMF is going to produce new projections in June. And from all indications, they are not going to look too good. So for the, for the short term, I think because of the impact of the pandemic, uh, there's not too much we can do. What we need to do is start planning for a better economic outlook from 2021. So we, we need to look inside to see how we can manage and generate more internal demand. You know, we have a particular problem in Nigeria. The biggest export we have, which is oil, is now experiencing some of the lowest prices we, we've seen in years. And in fact, it's not just the low price, but the fact that we have cargoes uh, of oil in, in Nigeria and other countries, the demand for, for the oil has dipped. So we need to ask ourselves, how do we focus on the other sectors of the economy that can help us generate growth? And in, we have it. We have agriculture. We need to focus on investing in that. We have creative industries on the continent that creates a lot of jobs for young people. Let's focus on that. We have some manufacturing capability. How do we make sure they have power supply so that they can indeed function? So we need to focus on the non-oil sectors. We also need to focus on gas because there's still a demand. Uh, people are still using gas, even if they're not using oil. And gas is seen as a tran transition um, fuel that uh, leads us maybe 10 years down the line to uh, full reliance on renewables. So we do have sectors we can focus on. Let's do that. Mm. I agree with you, but uh, Dr. Okunjoela, it seems like every time there's a problem with oil crisis, uh, we all run to diversification of the non-oil sector. And I'm speaking particularly for Nigeria. When you look at the performances of that sector uh, through subsequent governments in Nigeria, uh, their performance has been moderate uh, at best. How can we fast track diversifying the revenue, not just the economy, but the revenue of that sector? What do you think we're doing wrongly and what should we be prioritizing? I mean, you're absolutely right. I don't know if I agree with you completely that performance has been moderate. Actually, if you look at the, some of the numbers for growth within the economy, you see the oil sector has fallen as a percentage share of GDP uh, uh, and also as a contributor. Um, we, we have this divergent economy that agriculture had been growing quite well. I think creative industries that were not even measured before we rebased the economy uh, 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 five or six years ago, are now contributing. 
what you're absolutely right about is that we have not managed to tax, find a way to generate revenues out of these sectors. You are absolutely right that we are still highly dependent on one revenue source, which is oil. What we need to do is figure out ways to tax those other sectors better. It's not going to be easy because a lot of the activities in those sectors are the, in the informal sector with businesses that may not even be registered. So we have to embark on a long-term strategy. This is not something you are going to accomplish overnight. How do we attract the young people who are creating businesses, women who are very big in the informal sector? How do we support them to register their businesses and, and then eventually down the line, maybe four or five years from now, become taxpayers? How do we look at agricultural processing to modernize it so it can also become part of the formal sector? These are some of the things that we have to do to introduce to enlarging our tax base so that we can tax these sectors better. Uh, if I may take you back to the response of the continent to COVID-19, uh, some say that we are seeing different approaches and this may hinder uh, fast-tracking or speeding up uh, finding a solution or a cure to the pandemic, which is homegrown solution on the continent. I wonder, what's your take on that? Do you think that uh, there should be one coordinated response on the continent, or do you agree that it's not one size fits all and the current approach is okay? Well, first of all, let me say that we should commend the leaders on the continent for the speed with which they acted. Actually, I've been quite surprised at the unity of purpose that has come. On the continental level, the AU moved quickly to develop a fund that can support the African CDC and other CDCs within the continent. They have appointed an envoy to look at procuring medical supplies and a platform for the entire continent is being built as we speak, where all countries can go and see what supplies are available. The, the, the AU, the heads of state, uh, um, have all acted uh, with unity on this, which is impressive. They also implemented all these lockdowns, which politically is not easy, where most of our people earn on a da daily basis. Having said that, I don't think there's a one-size-fits-all in this response. In fact, even within a country, there's not a one-size-fits-all. The way you have to look at it is to say which area, what's happening in different localities. It may be that one area doesn't have as much COVID cases. In that area, you may want to say, okay, we can gradually open up. We don't have to implement complete lockdown. Other areas may be hot spots that have a lot of uh, COVID. Then you want to act differently there. Similarly, between countries, you cannot have a one-size-fits-all approach. You have to have a very nuanced approach in order to handle this. Of course, there are some overall guidelines that everybody must obey, which is the hand-washing as much as you possibly can, and the wearing of masks, um, and the social distancing. Those should be practiced everywhere, even where there isn't much, because if you don't do it, it will spread quickly. Beyond that, you have to have a nuanced strategy. And finally, just before we let you go, I wonder if uh, you would like to share your thoughts with us on the current development with the African Development Bank, as we do have a Nigerian Dr. Adeshino heading that in the eye of the storm. Uh, you've had your experiences in finan global financial uh, organizations such as the World Bank. What does this mean for Mr. Adeshino? What are your thoughts? I think, I, I mean, we... Uh, uh, Dr. Aki Adeshino has done a good job with the bank. You had a reporter just before who made, I think, a very good and important report. He's done a good job. He's one of our own. My extreme hope with this is that this will come out right, that we'll find a way through the problem. Dr. Ungazi Okonjo, Iwala, it's been such a pleasure having you on the rise this day. We really do appreciate your presence. Thank you so much. Thank you very much.